people like you who attend our programs and support our work and care about historic places. Uh, as is appropriate for our second in-person event post-plague, uh, half of the staff is homesick tonight. So <laughs> we are doing our best, uh, but please bear with us. Uh, that does include our executive director, Cyan Crump, and our usual MC for events like this, uh, Danielle Porter, director of preservation. So you're stuck with me instead, but uh, we're going to muddle through and it's going to be just fine. So I'm Jenny Joyce, and I'm a preservationist and community outreach manager for Historic Richmond. Uh, for those of you who are new to our programming, Historic Richmond is a nonprofit with a mission to preserve our diverse historic buildings, neighborhoods, and places, spark revitalization, and champion our distinctive architectural legacy here in Richmond. And we also particularly want to thank our wonderful sponsors, Dominion Energy and TCB Trust and Wealth Management for supporting this program and others like it. In 2002, we adopted a new strategic plan which envisions a more vibrant, inclusive, and sustainable future for Richmond. And part of that plan is to highlight the relevance of historic preservation and design in addressing contemporary issues. So at the national level right now, we're watching society grapple with issues of labor and workforce shortages, affordable housing crisis, sustainability, diversity and inclusion issues, and some of you might be wondering, what does preservation have to do with this? How can we solve those problems? Where is the brick and mortar? Um, we still have brick and mortar efforts. So recently we launched a facade grant program that focuses on neighborhoods that were historically redlined and helps homeowners with exterior renovation projects uh, so that we can keep the neighborhood in the neighborhood. And we're also working on workforce development so you have access to a trade person when you need one to do those exterior renovations. Uh, we are also highlighting these issues in our lecture programming, as you may have noticed. Uh, so tonight we're talking about diversity. Next month we are talking about affordable housing. So please come back. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel, March 9th. We are going to be having a panel discussion on affordability and preservation. And that's going to be very cool as well. So tonight we're talking about expanding the narrative. For a very long time, the fields of history and preservation have focused on the stories of a select few and we are working to increase the number of stories told uh, involving traditionally underrepresented communities. So traditional preservation practices don't always apply. For example, the National Register of Historic Places prioritizes architectural and material integrity, and that's not necessarily something that you find in some of these stories for these underrepresented communities. That architectural integrity isn't there anymore because their buildings were bulldozed to create a highway or something else similar to that. Uh, so, how do we work with the community to designate and protect those historic sites that maybe look a little different from what we're used to seeing? How do we better tell our complex histories and preserve the places that matter to all Richmonders? And our panelists this evening have been tackling those very important questions and more, and we can't wait to hear from them. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Blake McDonald and Krista Weatherford hanging out down below the screen there. Architectural Survey and Cost Share Manager for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, and in this capacity, he travels throughout the Commonwealth supporting the stewardship of Virginia's diverse past. Prior to his current role, Blake worked in cultural resource management, historic preservation advocacy, and museum education. So he's done it all. Krista is currently serving as the Director of Programming and Community Engagement at Neymont Foundation, overseeing the educational programs and community education partnerships. She's passionate about inclusive storytelling and is interested in balancing narratives, providing experiential history programs, and connecting people to places. In her work, she explores Neymont's historical relevance to Richmond, Virginia, and the United States as a location of intersectionality for the Gilded Age and the Jim Crow era. And sharp viewers may have noticed a discrepancy between the number of people on the screen and the number of people sitting down below the screen. Uh, our third scheduled speaker, Eric Craigsbold, is unfortunately unable to join us tonight due to a family emergency. So he is a citizen of the Pamunkey Pri Tribe, sorry, a digital illustrator and founder of the Native States Project, which uses art to bring awareness of tribes across America and remind people that they're still here and they still exist. Uh, so we apologize to everyone who is looking forward to hearing from him tonight. Uh, we are hoping to have him back in the future to share his perspective, and in the meantime, please do visit his website, thenativestatesproject.com, to learn more about his work. And now, I would love to welcome Blake to the stage. 
to go ahead and start things off. with um, her LGBTQ cohort, um, some of whom you see 
there. So at DHR, we began our LGBTQ Heritage Initiative back in 2015, right around when the National Park Service, which is one of our governing bodies, issued the LGBTQ America theme study, which you can see on the screen here. You can also see some of the initial goals of the initiative. Um, those included uh, to, to gather together scholars who were working on this, um, this topic, this, uh, this area, to document LGBTQ-associated places all across the state through field surveys, going out in photos of buildings and sites, to encourage existing historic sites to interpret their LGBTQ stories where applicable, and to increase the number of places associated with LGBTQ themes on the National Register of Historic Places and Virginia Landmarks Register. So the way that we did that um, over the first several years, we did create a, a cohort of scholars, folks who were doing LGBTQ history research all across the state of Virginia. We met several times a year, and that was a really nice network where we could help one another out. We also engaged a bunch of excellent BCU interns to build out a web page for us and stock it with materials like timelines uh, and bibliographies covering the entire state and what we already know, the resources already available for LGBTQ history. We have documented well over 100 places all around the state of Virginia, many of them here in Richmond, and added them to a map that's available on our webpage. And perhaps the most valuable and, and certainly the, uh, the most fun thing that we did over those first handful of years was our presence at Virginia Pride Fest, which is the largest LGBTQ celebration in the state of Virginia. It happens here in Richmond each fall. Uh, for the four years leading up to COVID, we rented a booth, we decorated the booth, we shared materials like local walking tours, and just talked to people about the work we were doing. You can see a photo in the upper right of one of our booths there. And this was a really interesting process because we started out at Pride Fest um, going in and asking people, you know, tell us what's important, tell us what your LGBTQ history is, where are the places that are important to you? And we pretty quickly learned that folks didn't really know how to do that. They didn't really know what we were asking, what places mattered, what didn't. So in some of the later years, we tried to, as you can see in this photo, bring as much material as we could and really show people here are some of the things that we're excited about. Here are some of the places we're documenting and why. And we found that that was a much better conversation starter and really got people engaged when they could look at some of the figures that we are highlighting and then start to make connections there. One product of the initiative that folks in this audience might be particularly interested in is our uh, historic site survey here in the city of Richmond. Uh, back a couple of years ago, I had a, a really phenomenal intern and they took it upon themselves to document about 30 places here in the city of Richmond um, and to write up this report with descriptions of each place, descriptions of their history, and then recommendations for further research. This is available on our webpage, um, so please do check that out. And I do want to be really clear that DHR is not the only group doing LGBTQ history work, certainly not in Virginia and not even in Richmond. I've put up on the screen here an admittedly incomplete list of all the organizations around the state that have active LGBTQ history research initiatives or have done so over the past couple of years. Um, and this list does not even capture all of the fabulous individual scholars and researchers who are doing their own work. So really, one of the functions of DHR's initiative is to act as a clearinghouse and to collect all of these sources um, and, and put them out to people, jumping off points, so that people can start and then build from, from what we've offered. The other thing that sets DHR's initiative apart is that we're trying to frame LGBTQ history in Virginia in the lens of preservation, historic preservation practice. Uh, mostly that entails trying to tie LGBTQ history to extant historic resources, buildings, objects, structures, sites, and historic districts. So ours really is a place-based approach. So now we're going to get to um, what we were just looking at with our poll a minute ago. 
I want to take a couple of minutes uh, to, to run through some of the people, places, and events that we've documented here in the city of Richmond, both to give you all a sampling of what we have available, but also to talk about some of the inherent challenges in doing LGBTQ history and um, interpretation. When you discuss LGBTQ history, it's often bisected by the civil rights movements of the mid 20th century, after which there tend to be a lot more, or generally more, openness around queer identities. When looking before that, what you'll find a lot of are, are cases of notable individuals who lived non-heteronormative lifestyles, who live lifestyles that today we might consider LGBTQ. And a perfect example of that in Richmond is Lewis Hinter. Louis Ginter was a tobacco magnate and a real estate developer who gave us such landmarks as the Ginter Park neighborhood, which he developed, and the Jefferson Hotel, which he financed. Ginter was also in a 40-year relationship with uh, John Pope, who was a business partner and also lived with him uh, in this house, among a couple others, on West Franklin Street. This house still stands. It's owned by VCU and is part of the West Franklin uh, Historic District, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. When Ginter and Pope lived here, they were the wealthiest men in the city of, of Richmond. And newspapers describe them as never pointedly seeking the affection of women, but having the most ardent affection for one another. They would not have had the language to self-identify in the 1880s and 1890s as gay, but they were clearly in a committed, non-heteronormative, for all we can see, romantic relationship with one another. The Ginter and Pope narrative is one that, that comes up a lot when you start doing LGBTQ history in Virginia and in Richmond, and it's certainly an important story to know and to share. But in doing so, we also have to recognize that these two men were able to live as openly as they did because they were wealthy and because they were well known. And if we only tell the stories of rich, white, LGBTQ men and women, we're only telling a tiny little slice of what's out there. So part of the work of the initiative is to document places that balance out that prevailing narrative by ensuring that black, Latinx, and other minority queer experiences are represented. And that brings us to Sister Rosetta Tharp. Tharp was a musician known as the godmother of rock and roll. She was really innovative in blending rhythm and blues and gospel, inspired all sorts of other artists on into the present. And what many people don't know is that she actually lived here in Richmond for many of her most productive years. This is the house that Tharp owned in Northside. Um, it's on Barton Avenue. It's in uh, National Register Historic District, uh, the Barton Heights Historic District, and although it had been previously documented uh, with the Department of Historic Resources, not until this project were we able to add that this was indeed Sister Rosetta Tharp's house here in Richmond. It's an important um, uh, addition to what we already knew about this property. Sister Rosetta Tharp was married several times and was commonly alleged to have had relationships with both men and with women including a, a long-term romantic connection to the singer Marie Knight. Tharp died in the 1970s and never openly said that she was bisexual or queer or any of those things. She also left very few personal papers, which is not at all unusual when you look at LGBTQ people of the past. Oftentimes they might do things like destroy their correspondence before they died. So you run up against this common challenge in LGBTQ history of, of proof. You don't have any proof. And is it fair to out someone who isn't here to express their own identity, who may have died 50 years ago, like Sister Rosetta Tharp? But importantly, when you're working with a history where prejudice against LGBTQ people made it unsafe and illegal to live openly, you really can't expect to find the same type of documentary evidence that you would in other branches of historical research. So sources that we may not traditionally consider worthy of inclusion, things like word of mouth or rumor or veiled reference or even code words and coded language, these really become crucial when you're doing LGBTQ history. And you know, I understand that that might 
that may sound like casting a very wide net and including people who perhaps wouldn't have identified themselves back in the day as LGBTQ. But the fact of the matter is that historical interpretation requires us to talk about the past with modern eyes, with our modern understanding. And you will also recall that when I define LGBTQ history for you, one of the ways it's defined is people who today might have been able to live openly as LGBTQ or queer. So rather than thinking about outing someone like Sister Rosetta Tharp, you know, I think this work really tries to honor the dynamic complexity of people like Tharp, and hopefully in doing so, to draw in some, some new modern audiences. But even when we look at Sister Rosetta Tharp, we're still um, on, our, on, on, the, on the vein of people who were famous, who were notable, who many of you raised your hand when I said their name. Um, and there are so many generations of LGBTQ folks whose names never made it into the history book. So how do we represent them? Part of what we try to do with this project is document gathering spaces um, important to queer communities. So I'm showing you here a former bar uh, which operated from the 1950s to the 1970s. It was last known as the Mailbox. It's on Shepherd Street within walking distance of here, right across Gary, Gary Town. This bar was part of a, a network of queer owned, managed, and friendly establishments all across Richmond, all across the state of Virginia. And it provided a really valuable space for LGBTQ folks to, to meet and convene um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, beyond the times that they couldn't um, do so in their home or their church or their school. You'll notice that it is very nondescript, and I'm going to comment more on that in just a minute. Um, showing you here another selection of LGBTQ establishments uh, across the city of Richmond, as well as a beautiful quote by Bill Harrison, the former director of diversity um, here in Richmond, which gets at exactly what I'm what I'm telling you. you know, these were places of community uh, where people could meet and and be safe and have one another. And so these places are often very um, nondescript in appearance, both in, in the modern time as well as when you look at historic photos. Um, and so from a preservation perspective, these do pose some challenges, because as we heard during the introduction, you know, traditionally preservation wants, wants pretty stuff. We want pretty buildings, things that communicate their historic function or have you know, architectural magnificence. And that's not what we're, what we're seeing here. And yet, um, these places are so crucial, just the way that for other communities, a church or a school would be. So it's a, a very important part of the work that we do with the LGBT Heritage Initiative is to honor these um, spaces that may not look like a lot, but have enormous importance with the community. And I'll point out, um, right here on the end is Babes of Carytown, which is still open, and best we can tell, it is the oldest LGBT bar in the state of Virginia, um, open since the early 1980s. Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit of a bonus site because I've got a bit of extra time tonight. So I'm adding one more. I didn't even bother putting it into the poll because I think we all know it. Um, Monroe Park is right in the middle of the VCU campus. It is, however, much older than the surrounding academic buildings. It was founded in 1851. It is the oldest park in the city of Richmond. In terms of uh, local LGBTQ history, Monroe Park is significant as the site of several of Richmond's earliest demonstrations and protests for queer rights. So this included a 1974 women's festival and a 1977 protest by the Richmond citizens for gay and lesbian rights against the homophobic singer Anita Bryant, who was performing nearby. These protests were some of the first LGBTQ public LGBTQ demonstrations, um, certainly in the state of Virginia, in, in the South, really. Um, and you know, this was a time when it was still dangerous to be out, to be public, um, just as, as we were uh, discussing with, with the bar a moment ago. And so it's, it's vital that we honor these places where some of that initial pushing back and explaining um, the inequity was occurring. Um, certainly that's the case with Monroe Park, um, but that was happening elsewhere in the state. Um, you know, I said Monroe Park was the earliest, and I'm, I'm wrong, but what was actually the earliest in the state of Virginia was this Pentagon ticket 
that you can see on the, the left hand side of the screen. 1965, federal workers are picketing in front of the Pentagon um, for mistreatment. Uh, and then you know, down in, down in uh, Tidewater as well, 1977 protest on Grandy Street, uh, actually also against Anita Bryant, who really um, galvanized queer people that, that year. And again, when it comes to protest sites and demonstrations, um, we again have a preservation challenge of you know, how do you put the site of a protest on the National Register? How do you honor something that is important, clearly important, but it's ephemeral? There may not be a specific historic resource associated with it. It didn't take place in a building, but instead on streets and sidewalks. Um, well, when we have places like Monroe Park, which is also already on the National Register, there is the opportunity to update our existing documentation to interpret these important events. Uh, but this is also a place where we hope and plan to use our historical highway marker program, um, which does not require actual standing historic buildings um, to mark where some of these early demonstrations happen. So that's something that we're, we're um, hoping to, to continue working on in the next few years. And that leads me right into the next steps with the initiative. First and foremost, we do want to continue documenting places, adding to our inventory of historic sites associated with LGBT history around the state, with a particular focus on uh, minority experiences. So I'm showing you here the Hippodrome Theater, which is also the, the cover slide. The Hippodrome is one of the only sites here in the city of Richmond that we've documented specific to the black LGBTQ experience. Um, our records show or there you know, indication that after World War II, this was a safe place for um, black queer men to, to gather. I showed you also the Richmond site survey a moment ago. I'm in the process of working with an intern to update that document, um, add about 15 additional sites, and those will focus on uh, minority experience here in the city of Richmond. We do want to continue trying to increase LGBTQ heritage visibility in the National Register of Historic Places and in our Historical Highway Marker Program. However, both of these programs require people to come to us and apply, either to have something listed or to put up a highway marker. Um, they are opt-in programs, like a lot of our programs at the Department of Historic Resources. Um, so we, we don't do a lot of going out and listing of things unless we know their support for it. Uh, both of those programs are also in very high demand, so it's hard for us to be proactive in the way that we'd like. Um, so we are looking for um, avenues where we can encourage the listing of sites um, with LGBTQ historic significance and highway markers um, and, and while still maintaining that very active program. And finally, a REACH goal is that I'd really love to develop a statewide context document for LGBTQ this would be a big report outlining themes and trends as well as the overall history of LGBTQ folks in the state of Virginia. Uh, both Maryland and Kentucky have LGBTQ um, themes studies, so we're exploring some grant funds that might be able to uh, support work like that. And so before I turn things over to Krista, I just want to say that I know we've got a lot of folks here in the room who are in the world of historic preservation or history or maybe education. And to close, you know, I would just really ask of all of you that when you're doing your work, um, keep in mind that queer people have been around forever. And if you come across evidence of same-sex affection and love and gender variance in your work, um, lean into that. You know, follow those leads. I recognize that it can be really challenging to you know the right words to use or to figure out how to express an identity that maybe is not your identity. Um, but there are people who can help you with that. I'm one of them. Um, and more importantly, you will be helping the whole LGBTQ community in that continuing effort to find identity. So thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. And I'm going to pass off to Krista. Changing of the guards. 
All right, well, hello. Um, my name is Krista Weatherford. I am the Director of Programming and Community Engagement at Maymont. Um, and that is a really big title, um, <laughs> one that I'm, I'm really trying to fill. Uh, I'm, I'm not only over all of the historical education, but also overseeing all of the environmental education and all of our wildlife habitats. So the nature center, all of the animals that are on the grounds, plus all of the educational um, programs that are going on. And of course, I look at Maymont as a 100-acre uh, educational outdoor space for teachers, for community members, everybody to come and visit and utilize those spaces. And so um, in 2025, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't think I touched anything, but anyway. In, and um, in 2025, that will be our 100th year as celebration as a public park. So we're really excited for some of these things that are happening um, to get us ready for that time period. Um, so as I mentioned, Maimon is 100 acres. Right here is what you will see as far as the historical corridor. Um, at the end, very far over there, you can see the mansion. Um, that is actually where two people, uh, James and Sally Dooley, lived 35 plus years of their lives. So 30 years or so that they were there, plus then now 100 years that the park has been open to the public. Um, and the grounds and the buildings are all things that they put in uh, for um, that house type issues, but also then uh, you can see that the Italian garden is pictured there. Um, and that lowers down to the Japanese garden. So those are two historic gardens that we have and that we are able to enjoy and utilize as program spaces as well. So Maymont's mission is to create experiences that delight, educate, and inspire. And um, I feel like, I know, I'm biased, <laughs> but this is what I do. <laughs> I educate, delight, and I inspire. So um, we have, uh, it, well, pre-pandemic, we had 18,000 school kids that would come through Maymont, um, the grounds, the buildings, um, all of that, uh, get a chance to, to see lots of things, do lots of things, and we were able to educate them. Um, but also, as you can imagine, um, having students K through 12 and even college age students come to Maymont, um, there is an element of delight. We have an opportunity to see faces as they light up and get so excited about seeing a turtle or a snake or getting a chance to go through the mansion and climb the stairs and see all of these cool things that they normally wouldn't see in their own homes. Um, then also inspire. I feel that um, a lot of my job is not only to, to educate the public about these resources that are here in Virginia and that, that are, are um, great resources for the public, but also that uh, these are opportunities for diversity in uh, careers. So they can come and they can actually see a person of color who is teaching about animals or wildlife or the environment or that they can go into the mansion and they can see a person of color who is telling stories about the people who not only lived there but also those who worked there. So this is very much where I feel like I live. I live it and I love it and I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to be at Maynard at this particular time in history. So if you, I'm sure you've been to Maymont, right? How many of you have been to Maymont? Okay, so I've got some folks that need to come and visit me. Yeah. I'll take you on a tour. <laughs> Actually, I'll probably turn you over to somebody who knows more. <laughs> but um, Maymont Mansion is, is beautiful. Um, we have the first and second floors that really show off the opulence, the, the luxury that the uh, Dooleys had. Um, they were uh, a wealthy couple in the early 18, well, late 1800s, um, and they they wanted to show it off. They, they were coming into society um, as this wealthy couple, so they wanted to show off their wealth. 
And so you see it in all of the things that are there, so the actual objects. Um, Mr. Dooley loved art. Um, he was on uh, several boards for art um, programs and things like that here in Richmond. And so he was an art collector. He also, um, he and his wife traveled the world over and they brought things back to their homes. So there are things that, um, you know, that are very unique to, to Maynard. There are things that uh, feel a little grand <laughs> for, for the spaces that they're in, um, but they're very, um, it's very telling of the, the type of people that they were and who they wanted to be how they wanted to show off their wealth. Um, with this opulence, there was also a need to show off their wealth through the people who worked for them. So they had anywhere from uh, six to ten uh, domestic staff workers that worked in the home. Think about that for just a minute. I have five people in my home. I don't have anybody that comes in and cleans up or anything. I am the maid and I am the dishwasher. Actually, my husband's probably more the dishwasher than I am. Um, but we are the cooks. We, we do all of the work. These folks were two people, and they had six to ten people who helped them with the cooking, the cleaning, and even getting dressed. Women could not do all of those eye hook things in the back without a lot of help to get them into those things. So lots of help that was needed. And that's just the people who were working inside the house. Then there were approximately 20 people who were doing the grounds and the maintenance. Most of these people that were working for the Dooleys between 1893 and 1925 were African American. So it's really important for us to tell their story as well. And it used to be that um, the, their story is very prominent in the home, um, but it is in select spaces, spaces that were workspaces. That's where you would prim primarily see or hear their stories. What we decided to do is to change some of that. And it's based on a review that, uh, professional review that was done in 2018. And uh, this review was done by Dr. Lornette Lee. And she came in and she had helped with the original project um, and had been very instrumental in it. So her coming back in 2018 allowed her to look at it uh, because she hadn't had the day-to-day, -day, that she had had some time to step away, several years, and then come back and see the, the exhibit again and then to rec make, make some recommendations for us so that we could actually move forward. Um, these stories are really important. There are stories about families, whole families that worked in the house. Um, one particular woman named Frances Twiggs Walker was of the cook there, and six of her eight children worked in the mansion various times. So these stories are really important. We have a lot of information about these families and how they work together. Um, and they're not the only ones. There were other family ties, like brother and sister who worked there. Um, others that were uh, other mothers and daughters who worked in the home. And so it's really important for us to kind of showcase these, these stories. So as you can see, um, Dr. Lee's uh, suggestions to us were that we highlight the personal stories of the staff members in all the exhibit spaces. So that meant not just in the basement, but on the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, um, but seeing everything and in its total. Um, then the tours, uh, having tours in the basement. So it used to be that you'd go into the tour, into the uh, basement area, and that. Um, uh, exhibition was self-guided. So you could walk in, you could self-guide through that, and then wait for the guided tour to happen. And so if you had five minutes before the tour, that's really the amount of time that you really spent in that basement area, unless you decided to, to make a point to come back. Um, now we have, have structured that differently, so it's a different experience. And also we wanted to make sure that the stories were interwoven. 
that it wasn't um, an upstairs and a downstairs story, as we hear so much. Uh, we, of course, Downton Abbey is really fascinating, right? We all love that. And now, of course, The Gilded Age, that story is really cool. But rather than telling these as separate stories in one house, we are interweaving those stories so that we are constantly hearing about the experiences and perspectives from different people. All right, so one of the things that we decided to do, the pandemic kind of threw everything up in the air, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, everything kind of went silent. It all stopped, screeching stop, halt, and we had to figure out what to do. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that in the future that we would never have to stop tours because we couldn't actually talk or give these guided experiences. So we created audio tours. And I know there are mixed emotions about audio tours. But the, the audio tours actually helped us to do a couple of things. One, it provided a consistent story throughout. So every person that came through had the same opportunities to hear those stories. Um, it also allowed us to, um, to put some background information in there uh, as far as music or soundscapes or those kinds of things. It also allowed us to uh, have quotes that were dramatized and we could actually, um, it, it's almost like listening to a play as you're going through. Um, I love the, the um, holiday tour because it's like gossip. You go in and, and there's this lady who's telling you about all the gossip of you know, the day and ooh, come and look at this and the Dooley's, you know, anyway, it's very fascinating. And so it's a lot of fun for us to be able to, to do that. Um, some of the other things though that this is allowing us to do is now we can offer this in different languages. So currently we are actually transcribing this into Spanish. And so um, hopefully by April or May, we will actually launch that Spanish tour. So, you know, really exciting things that we have an opportunity to do that before, as just using our guides, we couldn't do. So one of the other major issues that we found is that school groups couldn't come to Maymont and really have a, a holistic experience. Part of that reason is because the mansion obviously is only so big and you can't fit 120 students in the house at the same time. There's no way. So what we decided that we needed was another educational space that we could use. This way we can actually divide them up into smaller groups and rotate them through and we do something similar over at the nature center. So that was kind of our guide. So the stone barn, um, you may have known about the stone barn. We have a nice little herb garden out front. Um, it, it's a beautiful space. It was utilized for some years as a nature center. That was the first nature center back in the 50s. Um, and then after the nature center was actually built in, the, in 1999, then it became a space where we could do, um, some had some offices in there. Then at another point we had it open for um, uh, rentals and those kinds of things. And now we've decided we want something different. So we have created an opportunity for people to come in and use that as an orientation space on one side. And then the other side, as you can see here, is our active learning classroom. So students have an opportunity to sit down at these tables that are whiteboard tables. They can bring some of these uh, plaques off of the wall. They can take them back to their seat, their pod. They can talk amongst themselves. They have questions that they can answer. They can write on the table their answers, and then they can discuss it not only in their small group, but as a whole in, in general. Um, and this has been really uh, a wonderful opportunity because, as I mentioned, we can divide them up and we can rotate them through. And then we can build on the educational experiences that are going on in the mansion. So if we're talking to the students, especially those little guys, those little ones, the kindergartners, they're talking all about community. What a wonderful opportunity for us to talk about not only the community that Maymont is in, but the communities in which the workers 
the employees from Jackson Ward, from Randolph neighborhoods, that they were coming from and be able to talk about what they were able to bring back to their neighborhoods because of the work that they were doing. We've had multiple grants and, and wonderful opportunities to expand these narratives. Um, one of those was uh, getting to do some virtual lesson plans. As you probably know, with the pandemic, everything went virtual, right? And so even the schools, those poor guys in the schools had to go to those virtual lessons. So we were cranking them out too and trying to help them to, to give them some support. So one of the things that we created, um, this is a lesson plan that we made with the um, uh, Carter Woodson uh, Collaborative. And we were able to do this on um, the Great Migration. So as I mentioned before, uh, Frances Quick Walker, who was the uh, cook, her six children worked at the mansion. Four of those six took their families and moved to um, Philadelphia. So they were part of that great migration. So we have an opportunity then to also in, in tell those stories about trying to find uh, better employment, better opportunities for their families, better school situations, all of these things, um, better freedoms and privileges. And so we can talk about that as well. We have uh, a lot of tools that we used to create our, our new lesson plans and things. This one is one that I felt was most notable. Um, and this is a culturally responsive curriculum. And if you look at it, obviously the red is stop. <laughs> Just like our stop signs and, and our uh, traffic lights. And the green is what we actually want to get to. So the middle section is um, you know, that we want to make sure that we are showcasing multiple perspectives, that we're doing it through a critical lens that this is relevant to not only the, the history of Virginia, but also to the students who are coming and participating in these programs. Um, that there's rigor to it, that it's not, um, it, it's not just uh, um, a, a surface learning, but that it really gets into some deep uh, conversations and, and learning opportunities. And then the relationships. Um, whether that is student relationships or student and teacher relationship and really helping them to feel like they belong and that their history and that the information that they are learning about is, is important to them. All right. So Maymont's history as a public space, we have been a lot of things. We've been a home um, prior to uh, 1925. Um, we are, have been open to the ground, or open the grounds and the buildings um, as a place of touring and visitation. And there's some really complex histories here um, with that, uh, because uh, Mrs. Dooley, um, she was, well, the family, Mr. and Mrs. Dooley both, were of, uh, a, I would say, at least a segregationist mindset. While they were um, very philanthropic and they provided funding for um, African American and white causes, um, there was still this weird, uh, well, this separation that they, they tried to maintain, especially in politics. Um, Mrs. Julie wrote a book called Dim Good Old Times. Um, we're going to deep dive that next year, so. <laughs> Please look out for that. Um, but that was definitely a lost cause narrative in which she uh, you know, talks about uh, how wonderful it was in, in slave times and how they took care of the people of color and that, um, that they felt badly because they would have to now do it for themselves. Um, some real deep, deep stuff that we can digest and, and unpack later. Um, but with that then, Mrs. Dooley also uh, left Maymont to the city of Richmond, and it was supposed to be a place where everyone could come. So there's some history that we need to still dive into as to was it segregated, was it not? Anyway, we'll get to that another time too. Um, but then she also asked for one of her ladies' maids to remain on with the city of Richmond um, and stay in their employment to be not only a housekeeper, 
but also to give tours. So she was one of the first tour guides. Can you imagine the stories that that woman could tell about her life with the Dooleys um, and, and living through this time period? Unfortunately, the city of Richmond, I don't think, has those records. Um, they, they didn't keep any records of, of those tours or, or her recollections, which is unfortunate. But we have been able to do oral histories with many of the family members for her and the walkers and many others. So we have some uh, history and, and some knowledge of that time period. Um, and then, of course, we go through the, the other parts of um, Maymont and being a public space. But these are all so important, such great, rich stories, opportunities for us to really kind of deep dive into what was going on during that time when Jim Crow and the Gilded Age were going on parallel paths. Um, so where was the in intersectionality? How did that operate? How did that work? But obviously there were levels of trust here that are still complexities that we don't understand. That families would bring their other family members to work for the Dooleys. That the Dooleys would ask that people stay on after they die and give tours and, and help to represent them. So there was some kind of level of trust. Now what that was, I don't know exactly, but it's a very complex history, and I think it deserves to be told. Um, so, of course, at this point, it's, well, are we there yet? Have we made it? <laughs> no, of course, there's always, always room for improvement, always room for growth. Um, so we continue to look at our situation, what's going on in, in our tours, in our uh, visitor experiences, those types of things, look at how we can redesign things, um, how do we implement them, and then a, a now, uh, a, <laughs> I'm not gonna get that word, so I'm gonna just skip that. Um, how are we gonna evaluate it and see um, if it's actually doing what we want it to do? And then we're going to keep doing that over and over again. So the, the things that I've shown you today, the things that you go and see Maymont um, this, this week, this weekend, whatever it is, um, it may not be there forever. It's not really supposed to, right? It's supposed to continue to change, to show that it's relevance and it's um, uh, the opportunity for growth and expansion. So that's where we are. We are we are in that expanding mode, and I hope that you'll come and visit Maymont and see the changes that we have made, um, be able to participate in it, and I would love to hear your feedback. Tell me what you think. Um, tell me the stories that you would like to hear more about, and we will make sure that that happens. So thank you so much for coming tonight. So thank you so much to our two amazing panelists for speaking to us today. I'm hoping that you guys have some questions percolating. I do excellent. We have the first question. <laughs> okay. You guys also have a mic. You got it. Flip it on. Sharon is Karen. Is it on? Yep. Excellent. Hi, I'm Rhonda Bernstein. Thank you for your um, talk. And my first question is regarding the um, queer history. So places like the mailbox, which I love that name, um, <laughs> were, was it similar to other places where they sort of had this um, relationship with the police or the, you know, parades and things like that? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Um, so to frame all that out, until 1992, I believe, it was um, illegal via alcoholic beverage control regulations to serve alcohol to homosexuals. So police raids were happening in bars from you know, throughout the 20th century. The best protection was actually the mob. Um, so a lot of queer bars, um, all in across Richmond and Tidewater, and this is a national trend, were uh, owned or controlled by the mob. The mob would then pay off the police, and the police would raid there. Um, so the, the history that I wasn't able to get to specific to the mailbox is that it was a mob-owned bar. Um, there was actually a, a mob shooting there at one point in the 70s that wound up closing the bar down. Um, so it was a, being in a queer bar was dangerous because of 
police raids, you'd get arrested. And it was dangerous because if the community found out there was a queer bar, then they might not want it there anymore, right? So, you know, safety is a shaky term, but one of the ways that um, you could get a measure of that was, was mob protection. That's a great question. This row is just... <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark and Merritt. Oh, two great talks. I was so sorry the third speaker canceled, and now I'm delighted we all made the commitment to come anyway. Um, so, a little blended thing, first for Krista, and then a question for Blake. So, I had the privilege to be at Maymont for a thing about Japanese gardening um, last year, and one of the really interesting echoes of what you said is that the Japanese garden, when first planted, was done in an utterly Western way with some Japanese plants. And then over time, the principles of Japanese gardening and perception started to be honored. The concept of ma, the open space between things, and the paths wandering instead of being straight ahead. And so, you know, maybe a blending of your two talks is Maimon can have historical markers that, that in a non judgy way, just simply comment about the evolution of that space, just like the house has had an evolution of presentation. And I'm glad Lauren Lee was part of your team. She's awesome. Um, Blake, my question for you is, um, I'm a Russianist. I study Russian politics. And you're surely aware of the horrific things going on in Russia where homophobia is a marker of nationalism. Um, there's a group called Pussy Riot. Yeah, I just said those words out loud, and I'm actually a nice person. Um, you know, just like the name of the group tells you, and they do incredibly edgy things, and uh, including acknowledgement of queer as a human right. So um, if you're aware of these phenomena at all, do you take part in some of it? Do you see old stories being played out on a stage that's familiar to you and others from your historical researches? I'd just be interested to have you comment on that. Well, that's a big question. Yeah. Um, what I will say is that, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, DHR is one group doing LGBTQ heritage research. We're one piece, and we're trying to amplify other voices, but there are uh, a number of LGBTQ scholars, history scholars, who are taking more of um, an activist approach. Uh, I flash on the screen for just a minute, but there's an amazing project out of Rona called the Southwest Virginia LGBTQ history project. They're doing, um, frankly, a lot edgier stuff than, than we're doing at the Department of Smart Resources. Um, so I highly recommend that you, you check them out. Um, and I mean, do we see trends in history? Of course, all the time, everywhere. Um, and so, I mean, I'm happy to expand on that. But um, part of the value of in all regards, certainly on the computer's organization, is trying to become a little bit more aware of those trends and you know, what are the markers of them um, and, and what might be you know, coming in the future from what we can see in the past. Thank you. Anyone on the center? <laughs> Expand out from that magical row. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question. Like, um, I'm a trans woman who just moved to Richmond a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thanks. Um, it's hard to find um, one of the, I know the queer bars to go to in Richmond, but beyond that, you said there's documentation, there's information, and uh, I'm sure if, if we delve into the archives or papers, it can be found, but for someone new here trying to find what's going on, and my question is not trying to be aggressive and say, where is it? But more, you mentioned earlier, um, the line between outing and documentation, and like, I don't want to be attacked and killed. Um, so there's, there's a question about safety in terms of saying, where's the line of history and now? And uh, you, you mentioned babies, and I, I didn't see some of the other familiar bars on there. And so like, what's the decision making? on drawing that line between history and now and what's safe to share and what's not safe to share? Excellent question. Welcome to Richmond. Um, that has come up a number of times. And I'll say that this work started before the Pulse Massacre. And that really changed the conversation around sharing queer spaces 
Um, and we've actually had some of our partners um, choose to pull back a little bit in terms of ways that they were interpreting space, not here in Richmond, but in other parts of Virginia, um, over community concerns. And so, you know, part of this work is listening to what people want to have shared, how they want to communicate um, their history. And um, an aspect of that is, you know, when is it appropriate to keep something uh, maybe not as widely known? I'll say the level of documentation that we use in this project is um, similar to what you can get on Google Street View with a few sentences, sentences of historical interpretation. So um, I would hope that, you know, I would hope that it never gets used for any purpose other than magnifying, elevating um, how great your history is. Um, but I don't have a great answer to you other than that we do talk about that from time to time. It's something that we're sensitive to um, when folks bring it to us as, as you know, an issue in their community, uh, taking things off the web page if we need to. Um, and that, that conversation has really uh, taken on a new light with some of the mass shootings in the past few years. And uh, if you haven't already, check out Diversity. Um, they're a wonderful organization with a lot of different branches, and it's, a, it's an awesome community. So I'm holding the mic, and I have a question, so I'm going to be selfish for a minute, and then I will share again, I promise. Um, and this is for both of you. The National Trust has released sort of a brief stating that inclusion and diversity is something that we want to work on in the field. And that means not just inclusion and diversity in the stories that we tell, but inclusion and diversity in the people who are telling the stories. And so I am curious to hear from each of you, because you are working with these um, minority histories and these lesser told underrepresented stories, um, how important do you think it is to make sure that there are stakeholders involved in telling these stories? And are there ways that people who aren't stakeholders can contribute to that and sort of elevate those voices? Well, at, at, as I mentioned before, um, at Maymont, it, it's uh, been really interesting recently as we have gone through and hired new staff, specifically for um, historical education that we have really um, thrown the net out wider. We've been looking for uh, specific people that can come in and actually help us tell these stories. Um, I, I feel that it's important to have uh, a whole diverse uh, population there. So we have um, people now on our team that not only represent um, different ethnicities or races, but also that represent the LGBT community that represent folks with um, disabilities and so now we have um, a little bit more diversity in the groupings um, and those that are telling it I, I really feel that um, being african-american myself it feels like the only place that you can find African-American interpreters for history is at the history museum at the black history museum and there are other histories <laughs> that are out there that still need that interweaving of a white and black narrative. Um, and so I felt like it was very important when we were hiring staff that we made sure that we had both black and white represented there and that they were both telling both sides of the story. It wasn't only the African American people that were hearing the stories of African Americans, you know, so are telling those stories. So it has to be interwoven. Um, I mean, building on part of what you said, certainly the field of historic preservation is not yet diverse enough, and then you can draw down to the field of LGBTQ historical research. It's not yet diverse enough. A lot of the early voices in that movement were white gay men white lesbian women um, and as we try to amplify work that's happening across the state and assign places to research that some of our colleagues are doing we just try to be really cognizant of you know whose voices are being represented in terms of the research we're putting out and when we look at historical figures like that comparison 
between Lewis Ginter and Sister Zeta Tsar, making sure that we're not putting out all white pieces. Um, but that's, I mean, that's a challenge. It's something that we're continuing to struggle with, and we're always trying to think about striking that, that balance to the extent that we can with the research that's been done within a community that struggles with diversity in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. I saw a hand over here. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I have a correct question for Krista. So, it, you know, it sounds like you all have done a, a great job documenting a lot of the labor history when the Dooleys were residents of the property. But, you know, you all are coming up on 100 years of, of city control. So I'm just wondering if you're thinking of maybe expanding some of that history um, to the 20th century and what that looked like over time, especially as obviously Richmond was going through major demographic transitions during that time with massive resistance and white flight and everything else going on in the city and um, who was in control of city government. And I'm just wondering if, if you all have been making progress on that or if, if that's in the works at all to document 20th century labor history. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, it, that is something that we are working toward. Um, we have not completely dived into that, um, in part because of changes in staff and, and different uh, changes in perspectives of things um, here that we've had recently. But um, our new curator is extremely excited about getting a chance to, to look at that time period from the, the time that the Dooleys passed away until um, today, you know, to see who are our users. Um, where it was the park segregated at some point because we know that all of the parks around that area were segregated but we have we stumbled upon some photos that were sent to us by William and Mary and um, in those photographs they were African-American people who were visiting Richmond and they were at Maymont so we have pictures of them and that's in the 40s so we're, uh, we're real hopeful that we'll find more evidence like that. But that was something that just kind of fell into our laps and has really kind of helped us to, to see that we need to be looking at more history than just when the Dooleys were there. Um, another uh, priceless piece of, of information that, that I'm always wondering about are who were the CCC people that actually worked at Maymont in the city era to help build some of the walls and the bridges and the bathrooms and, and those types of things. I, I really want to know more information about that. Um, and so that's another place where I think we can get, get some, dig down a little bit further. Um, but there's also the, the history of before the Dooleys. You know, what, what was it? We know that it was a dairy farm just before the, they purchased it. So what was it before then? What, who were the native peoples who actually lived there? Um, so there's there's so much for us to do. Um, and yes, we're looking forward to figuring out how to do that research and really bring that to the table as well. Thank you. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions before we unleash you on the snack table. Anyone else have a question? <laughs> Hi, sorry, it's me. Um, I have a question for Krista. Um, my knowledge of history is limited mainly to food. So, um, there's really great literature and research that's been put into the history of cuisine at Monticello, for example. Yes. The, the black people who worked, uh, well, didn't work exactly, were enslaved and forced to work for Thomas Jefferson's family learned in France and were taught techniques that they brought to America and invented many dishes that we now take for granted. And I'm curious if you know if there's similar histories that uh, someone who just loves food <laughs> could connect to at Maimon, for example. If these people were cooking the food and, and preparing uh, the stuff, there's a story in cuisine and, and culture and food that may still be here. I just don't know anything about it. Yes, actually. Um, so we know that uh, Francis Twiggs Walker was very fluent in French cuisine, um, and then she put a southern style to it, you know, a twist to it. Um, and so there are there are records of uh, specific foods that she created that were loved by everyone. 
Um, and uh, so we're hoping that we'll be able to bring more of that to the table as well as we to, to develop our programming and, and flesh it out. Um, now, I've always been fascinated with food, as you can tell. <laughs> so food is my, is my go-to. I love food. And, and um, like I said, she had some specific dishes that we you know that she made that I want to try. I want to come to that, that project, that program, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi. Um, my question is the question talking about food, I'm also a food lover. <laughs> By any chance do you have uh, contact with Walker's family? Maybe work hard uh, on the same uh, interest of food or cooking food or maybe they have their own restaurant or there's any opportunity to bring a family member for your 100th celebration? Yes, I work and all other. Wonderful question. Um, yes, we, I, I alluded to it in my presentation a little bit, but we have worked with some of the descendants and the Walker family because there were so many of them that worked at the mansion that those are the folks that we have the most connection with. And um, yes, that's where we have learned about the specific foods that Mrs. Walker would cook and that that was passed down from several of her generations. So um, there were, I think, four in the family that were cooks as well, um, and then they passed it on to their children. So really right now what we need to do is pick up the next generation. Um, the Forrest Walker Woodson um, is getting older and frail now, and so it's our turn now to, to make that new connection with the next generation. Thank you. Okay, one last question. We are going to wrap up. I'm getting frantic motions from Catherine. <laughs> it's a quick one. Um, so kind of pivoting off of descendant communities, um, do your organizations have honorarium or reparations built into your policies when working with uh, different individuals um, in doing programming, history work, things like that? <laughs> Um, so that is something, that is a process that we are developing at DHR. Um, certainly honorarium when we're working with uh, BIPOC communities um, where possible. We're also a state agency and we work with limited funds. So um, that, is, that is something that we have been talking more about in the past probably three years than, than we ever have So. We also uh, provide honorarium for, uh, especially like the descendants. So Doris Walker Woodson, she actually uh, was an employee as well as on our board of directors for a time, and um, really helped us to formulate the uh, 2005 opening of the domestic service exhibition. Um, since then, as I mentioned, uh, her involvement has reduced because she is more frail and, and older. Um, however, if we are working with anyone in the community, uh, we provide honorarium as much as possible um, for them. Um, there are some that obviously will uh, have volunteered their time and, and have given us that um, as a nonprofit, but we, we try and build that into our budget yearly. Um, so that may severely limit the amount of time that we can have someone um, involved, but we do provide that. So what I'm taking away from a lot of this is the importance of community and the importance of getting people involved and telling those stories, which I think is a really wonderful idea to leave with. Uh, so I do want to thank you both for being here tonight and for sharing your work with us. Thank you to everyone who came. We're so happy to see you. We're so happy to have your support. Uh, if you are curious about some of these, these preservation priorities that I mentioned that the National Trust is talking about, diversity and inclusion, um, growing workforce, affordability, uh, you can see those briefs that they've written online at preservationpriorities.org, or you can come to our event in two weeks right here and hear about preservation and affordability in Richmond, Virginia. And with that, I'm going to close and release you to the food and the drink in the back.